Hello, everyone. This webinar is being recorded. Okay, continue. Um, I am Mara Frazier. I am the curator of dance here at the Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee Theater Research Institute. And I am thrilled to welcome you to this conversation today with Beth Cattleman, the curator of the Theater Research Institute, and our amazing panelists of His Kings. And so we're going to move on to that conversation very quickly. Um, so this is 25 years of drag kings in Columbus and beyond. Um, and so as we, um, as we talk about this, I just want to um, tell you I'm very excited. Um, I'm kind of, I'm a bit starstruck. Now, um, a bit about our collections related to this, this talk today. Um, the Performing Gender Collection is a collection dating from 1857 to the present. It contains programs, posters, photographs, postcards, all kinds of ephemera relating to a whole variety, a spectrum of theater performance, including drag kings and drag queens and much, much more, all kinds of um, performances of gender, including pants performers and, um, and male impersonators. Um, so, over time, we have lots of different ways that playing with gender and experimenting with gender show up. Um, here we have an image of Miss Vesta Tilly, um, circa 1906. This is a postcard that would have been sent around and Vesta Tilly was a male impersonator performer, a British performer. Um, so there's lots more in this collection that I hope over the next series of three, these three events to be able to show you more from the Performing Gender Collection as well as some other really exciting related collections here at Thompson Library Special Collections. But just know that this is open for research. And if you're interested in finding out more about any of our collections here at Thompson Library Special Collections, including this one, please feel free to contact me. My email is here on the screen, fraser.88 at osu.edu or Beth Cattleman cattleman.1 at osu.edu. Don't hesitate. We, we would love to have you in. Come take a look at things. We are open to the community. Um, so please contact us. Come and see us. So Beth, take it away. Um, I, I'm so excited for this conversation. Thanks, Mara. I am excited too. I can't believe we have all of the founders of the His Kings here with us today. That is pretty cool. And uh, I think uh, Julie can uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but we're almost to the day of the 25th anniversary, which is really exciting. So wow. we're gonna get the conversation started, um, but uh, just uh, up front here, could each of you tell us a little bit about yourselves and introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll start. Um, I'm Julie or Julia. I go by both Applegate. I use she pronouns. Um, I was here at the beginning, mostly from the perspective of a producer and a music lover. And so I had been DJing in college. And um, when I came out as a lesbian, um, being in the bars and nightclubs was a really big part of my identity. It's how I met my friends. Um, Luster was one of those first people I met when I moved to Columbus and uh, we, well, all of us were kind of dragging around the bars together and um, lamenting the shortage of, of things for us to do. And so um, that was my entry point to this whole world of um, his kings. Um, I am Luster Singleton. I use he, they pronouns, and it was my birthday. <laughs> and so really wanted to do something for my birthday. Julie and I had been really like pondering why did gay men own kitsch? Why did gay men own fun? Why every time, um, you know, lesbians, uh, in the context of a conversation, it never went to, like club and fun and just all of this other stuff. And so it just kind of, Julie was DJing and um, there was an opportunity at the local lesbian bar called Summit for her to DJ. And she's like, um, 
you got to help me. You got to help me with this. What are we going to do? And I'd always thrown a, a party for my birthday. Uh, at that time, I'd also seen the Shinjuku boys, uh, which are Japanese, uh, were a group of Japanese. We would use the word cross-dresser, but they were gender benders. They were female, biological females who sang karaoke to scads of women in Japan. And I was really caught up by that. And um, Helen also always kind of played around um, with gender. And I don't know, it just came together. Very cool, thanks. I so we can oh. flip it over to Helen there, yep. Hi, my name is Helen Harris. Uh, I, I went and go by Billy. Uh, Billy Dustin Sand was uh, my stage name. Um, <clears throat> I dabbled into alternate persona of a cowboy ever since I was little. I didn't know cowgirls even existed. They were just cowboys. Because a lot of people ask me, why not a cowgirl? Well, I didn't even know they existed. Um, I was born in Texas. I was raised in Greece. Um, I was always fascinated with horses. I run away from home to the backyard, not very far, with a note saying that I will not be back unless you get me a horse. Um, <laughs> For your answer, please uh, uh, answer me. I'm in the backyard, which I was, I was five. Uh, anyway, but I was always fascinated with cowboys. Um, during my, uh, I was majoring in photography back in OU, which is where I met Julie. Um, and in one of my photography classes, we had the assignment of self-portraits. And that was the first time that I actually put the persona on instead of just acting out with guns and walking. Um, uh, this was the first time that I actually, I don't know, brought it out in terms of fit appearance. And I took some cork from a wine bottle and burnt it. And that was the first time I ever created a beard. And that's where that photo um, that's on the poster uh, was done, I think maybe a year or a year and a half before um, the first show at Summit. Um, that's kind of how I fell into it. <laughs> Hi. Met? Yep, go for it, Yvette. Yeah, it, uh, it didn't switch over to me, sorry. Uh, <laughs> my name is Yvette Demoleski, and uh, I go and have gone by Derek sen Sr. and Jr. Long story, just think of it as little devil, little angel, right? Uh, and I fell into drag. Uh, actually, I had a similar story to Helen. Um, I always dabbled into what was uh, conceived to be boy or male items since uh, I was little. And I, I always dressed up in whatever I was able to find that was uh, male oriented. And of course that occasional Wonder Woman suit. Uh, I, my first memory of dressing into something that was a typical male back in the day was uh, wearing a football jersey that my brother had. Uh, it was great. There was a picture of me. My parents were all proud. And I'm like, really, you guys are proud of this? Uh, so I kind of fell into the whole, uh, you know, gender bending or drag king world. Uh, I remember Helen and I were friends and she was talking about, Hey, you know, uh, Julie and, you know, Lester are thinking of like, what can we do in Columbus for entertainment? And I was like, Hey, why not drag like drag Kings, but instead of drag Queens. And, uh, I don't know if you remember that story, Helen, it was a long time ago. And so, uh, so yeah, I just kind of fell into it that way. Uh, and I've always been, I, I like to think of myself as a gender activist and to give voice to other folks in the community. And I'm really hoping that, you know, our performances allowed that environment. 
for our community. Great, Sue, awesome. I think you're up. Hi, um, so I'm Sue Steyer. And oh goodness gracious, uh, drag goes way back for me. Um, my very first memory of doing drag, um, I might have been five or six. <laughs> um, I cut the bows off of my little church shoes and taped them to my little blouse. <laughs> and I would sit in front of the mirror and I would like, I would wear my little kid's blazer and like, I. And I would like just kind of like dance in front of the mirror and <laughs> it's so funny, you know, because I didn't, it just to me was very exciting to do that. And, um, and so when I was in high school, um, my sister Jenny, who looked a lot like me, who was 21, gave me her ID so I could get into bars. So I was going into gay bars the second I could drive. So at 16 is when I first started to see drag queens um, in Akron, Cleveland area. And I just was like, wow, like, what are they doing? It's so awesome. Like they're having so much fun and everybody loved them and they would throw money at the drag queens. And I thought, oh my God, this is just the best. Like, and so I loved going to these shows and I was going out probably three times a week to these gay bars around Cleveland and then going to school. And, you know, so by the time I was in college, um, I had met Helen, we were both photography students together. And, um, and then I had met uh, Julie and Yvette um, through, through them and then eventually everyone else. And, um, and I too was fooling around with gender and my photography assignments. Um, I just was really, it was fun, it was exciting. And I just thought I can do this, you know, I can do anything I want. <laughs> um, I was a very ballsy, like 21 year old kid. And then also I decided I needed to drop out of college for, <laughs> <laughs> for a period because we were in school at OU and all the gays were in Columbus and that's where I wanted to be. And, <laughs> and so, yeah. Um, I got to kind of get to know everybody and um, and then somehow or another, I don't even remember exactly how the conversation started, but it just was like, let's, let's do like a drag performance. Like the drag queens do it, why can't we do it? And I had never even seen a drag king perform ever. I didn't even know what they're supposed to do. I didn't even know about anything. So I just named myself Tony because it seemed like a, a masculine name. And, and I just did what I had been doing all along through the years, like with my facial hair, like I would steal my sister's mascara and like attach it to like the hair on my face. And so that's, that's what I did. And that became kind of like what a lot of people did. Um, and you know, the, the ace bandage and the whole, yeah, and so when we had our first performance, it just, it blew my mind, like, how, what an amazing success it was and how much people wanted more. Remember <laughs> how nervous story. you guys were? You all were so nervous. <laughs> yeah, we were. We were so nervous, and we were so packed, we didn't expect it. No. We did not no. expect it. We thought some friends would come. It yep. was so packed that we had yep. to sneak our own friends yep. in the back door yep. to get them in because they mm -hmm. had shut off coming in the front. Yeah. It was like, it was insane. It really yeah. was insane. Mm -hmm. So do you remember some of the numbers that you did for that first performance? Oh, I'm coming out. I oh. did. When Julie came back and said, because I feel... So they were kind of playing with this gender and Julie came back and was said something to me. Well, I have always been fascinated with drag queens. And even though I, you know, was raised like a tomboy and I only felt, I always thought growing up, I looked like a bad drag queen because I'd heard that whenever I had to put on like girl clothes. But I also was fascinated with Flip Wilson. It seemed like any, any um, famous comic had a female, had a drag queen in them. 
And I would just study that and study that. And so they were doing the show. I was like, well, I know I'll be the drag queen and be the host. I'll be the hostess. Mm -hmm. And that's how we went. And I can't remember. I go by Lestivious and Luster de la Virgion. Uh, Lestivious was a response. We were some pretty radical women's studies. Julie and I were in women's studies and our our group were very, we were big agitators. And I can't, and especially around sex positive stuff, we were really over the comfortable shoes and all of that. I'm not mad at anybody for the moo-moos and the comfortable shoes. I'm not mad about any of that. With acoustic music, I, I'm, I'm okay. But <laughs> <laughs> now, and so, I forget how I ended up, someone wrote us a letter. So I got a letter and they called me lascivious, said that I was acting lascivious. And so I just was like, hmm. And I turned that into my drag name. And then Luster, and I love Victor Victoria. To, mm -hmm. to me, I can only put lascivious on. At that time, I could only put lascivious on knowing that she was a drag king. She is a drag king who has a drag queen. That is the only way that she happens is she's a drag king. And the rest, as we say, I mean, they were packed up on the stage like this. You could barely get to the bar. Um, you could barely get to the bar. And Julie, the DJ booth was way in the back, sort of elevated. And we just kept like looking at each other like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, what have we done? We had a second show that we weren't planning on having, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't we have a second show the second night that we weren't planning on having? Mm -hmm. But there were so many people who didn't get in. And mm -hmm. so we did it a second night. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. How about the rest of you? Do you remember your numbers? <sighs> I, I remember my characters. I don't remember the songs I was dancing to. <laughs> okay. I was, um, I, I know I was a leather daddy. Cause again, like I, I had to just go with um, like these, these ultra masculine characters. So there was no specific person in there, but um, yeah. So I just collected any kind of leather item I could find. Like I had some chaps and like some, you know, like, like a typical, like leather daddy. And that was one of my personas. Um, and I don't even think we were lip syncing. We were just, I, I we were literally just dancing around, you know, in drag and then doing like little lap dances for, you know, everybody The you know, <laughs> and then I was like, um, I think I was a construction worker too, was another one. So just, you know, the, the whole village people. <laughs> Just throw them all in there. <laughs> uh, it was so fun. Oh, God. Well, Luke Skywalker was another John one Wayne. of mine. Yeah. <laughs> didn't you do like John Wayne or something like that? You did some like cowboy. <laughs> you definitely did a cowboy number. I don't know. I can't even remember. You were like all cowboy down. Like I can see it, but I can't think of. Probably, probably. That wasn't the village uh, people, was it? That was later on, right? Yeah. That was later yeah. on. I, yeah. can't, I can't remember what you did of it, of that. And what was so awesome about it is without even trying, we dipped into all these genres of music, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. also made it accessible um, you know, one of our things was, if you can't find, if you can't find fun here, you just don't know how to have fun, you know, because if yeah. you don't like that number, go get a smoke, go to the bathroom, go whatever, <laughs> it's pretty certain that the next number or two will be to your liking. And we did that without Trying. effort. Yeah. Uh -huh. How about you, Helen? Do you remember? I think I, I'm pretty sure I did a cowboy. I do not remember the song though, and I don't even know if we were lip syncing either. I think we were just straddling, oh, like more like a fashion <laughs> show. Because I think one of the first ideas we had about doing a show was a fashion show. That was the first. I don't know. Oh, event. Yeah. We, we were talking, and we 
said if we would do a fashion show and then one idea led to another and then into drag and then but the very initial um idea after julie told us hey guys i got a gig at summit i need i needed to be um memorable different let's think of ideas let's brainstorm on how we can make it different and i think the first thing we talked about was a fashion show um event i think yeah, yeah. and then yeah. it started developing and then we talked to sheila and then all the ideas just dry kings yeah <laughs> we have a yeah. comment in the chat that helen did you do one to an engineer song to come on ride the train <sighs> Oh, oh yes, probably. Yes, I probably. did. Yeah. That sounds that was, about right. That was later. Yes, I did. I did. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my god. Oh god. So, Julie, yeah, what is what is a memorable moment for you from that? What do you remember from that first? Oh, from from that first night, we so we started out as as you're hearing us say, calling this event Fast Friday. So we we didn't start mm. out saying we're doing a drag king show. We said. We're going to do this event. Um, there was a very popular event in town at the time called First Friday. That was the night every lesbian in, mm -hmm. I don't know, three hours drive away would come yep. in the for. And we, and that was an awesome event, but we were kind of just tired of it. And so yeah. we chose our name as a spin on that and called it Fast Friday. And we decided it's going to be the second Friday of every month. And it's going to be, uh, we're going to have awesome music. Um, we're going to have a band. We booked the band for that very first night. Jaguar and, Five. Intermission. They open and intermission. <laughs> like, yeah. So we had, we didn't, we weren't just doing one thing because this is not how we rolled. We did it all. We did <laughs> DJ. We did a band. We did um, the Dyke slash Drag King Revival is what we called it. And from that night, I mean, mm -hmm. a couple of key memories. One, just the absolute insane number of people that were packed into that bar. I mean, this is a bar that typically had 22, 30 people hanging out on a Friday night. The people would change over the night, but it, it wasn't, it was not packed to the gills every night. That was a rare occurrence. Mm -hmm. And this was like well over fire capacity and yeah. a line out the door and around the oh, corner. Yeah. And just, I just remember, oh my God, it was so it, many people. It revived um, Jax. You know, I mean, I, I, we called it Jax. I know it as yeah. Jax a go go. And it, you know, the longest, the longest lasting lesbian bar on the Eastern seaboard. But it really was mm -hmm. kind of starting to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we couldn't get into the boys' bars. And we were like, whatever, we're certain we could do it ourselves. And so we went there and I believe that, that Jackson Go Go um, experiences a good 10, 15 more years directly related to mm -hmm. our relationship with it. We made sure everyone knew it was our home bar. Mm -hmm. We, you know, I like marketing and <laughs> things like that and just watching how other folks did it so that if they came in town, where would they go? They would go there because that was our home bar. And then other things spun, other people started doing things there because I believe because of us. Mm -hmm. I, I truly believe that in my, in my heart of hearts that we brought another understanding of lesbian and of women's space, mm -hmm. we brought that in a celebration of, you know, uh, well, we didn't have the word then, gender nonconformity. You yeah. know, we didn't have that word then. That was something that was just starting on the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that. So it's a great uh, point. This whole idea of kind of the importance of the drag king culture um, twenty five years ago. What do you all see as the importance of? I mean, what you were doing and it kind of in the bigger picture. 
mean, I think it laid the groundwork for so much conversation around exploding gender binaries. You know, I mean, we weren't we weren't using that terminology. I don't think as quite as explicitly this idea of binary gender gender, but I think we were exploding it all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's who we were as individuals. I think many of us were grew up. I was a tomboy. You know, I didn't come to this experience um, seeking an outlet to perform masculinity, but I ended up doing it mostly because I was just shy. But when I did it, I felt like, oh, this is very comfortable for me. I, I like sideburns and I like finding my breasts. And it felt like part of who I was, even though for me, I transitioning wasn't part of my story. It, it is became the story for some of our, our um, members. I would, I would agree with that, Julie, um, you know, because at the time, you know, like you, you were, it, people, I mean, people were lesbian or gay and there was a very small amount of people that were like transgender. And if you were somewhere else on that spectrum, you really had no other place. And so like, I felt like drag really allowed people to explore that space. You know, and like, I mean, I'm, I, you know, use she pronouns and, you know, I don't consider myself a transgender person, but, um, you know, I got to play with that and figure that out. I didn't really know for sure. You know what I mean? And, um, and some people played with it and figured out, you know, that they needed to transition in other ways. Um, so it was really a wonderful outlet um, for really exploring your own identity and then also basically giving an okay to everybody else. You do it too, because that's when everybody else is like, we want to be part of the show too. And that's when it got really big and, and it became a whole theatrical production and just, you know, it just, but it was in the context of having fun and being free. I have nothing but amazing memories of that period. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but on that first night, we didn't have that many numbers between no, ourselves. There we were just didn't. three of us. They so only do had, them twice. We had advertised, like but I think we had we had advertised, bring your music and you can get on stage. Don't oh, that's how don't magic that. ends up on that's how magic ends up on stage. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that night oh, is because is you're right, it was we sort had, of like a drag karaoke mm -hmm. type of thing, you know. It, it wasn't was. just us. Mm -mm. When I remember that first night, Helen, uh, it, I, I vaguely recall one of the songs. It was uh, Patsy Cline. I don't know which one, but I was a sailor boy. I wore a, a, a one of the white tanks, an A shirt. Okay, I, yes. I couldn't get away with that now. There's no amount of binding that can help that problem. <laughs> uh, and then I, I remember you being the captain of the ship, you know, with your with your blazer walking down and and then Julie was mixing the music and I'm like okay come on Julie just switch over because I can only mop so much right <laughs> and uh everything just like flowed perfectly and I I remember falling off the stage and I just got right back up and acted like it didn't happen but that is all I remember from that first show I, I don't even remember having the second show but you know, to be fair, um, yeah, I, I see your point in all of it, Sue. It, um, you know, the time was right. You know, there, you know, the gay community was growing larger, and we were we were needing creativity, but we also needed that safe space. And I too was able to explore gender. Um, I've always believed, for me personally, that gender is a continuum, and so I kind of flop around with gender. Uh, and it is a social construct. Nobody was born with a dress. Nobody was born with a suit. It's just, we just are. And uh, so, and a lot of my numbers, especially further down with my His King's career, I remember uh, doing numbers that there was a lot of gender bending and it was a lot of, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, not butcher femme, but androgynous. I, I was trying to go for that, that angle. And I was trying to speak to the folks in the audience, like, it's okay, like, just explore. And I just felt it was a safe space for me and for so many other folks. 
I always wore, uh, Lascivious always wears a cod piece. And mm. she does that to help. I mean, and Lascivious has detachable breasts. And so <laughs> I would make, I would play around with that. And people would be like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> How did you, what, what? You know, and they, they'd always say, are you a man or a woman? It'd be like, I'm whatever you want me to be. You know, however you catch me in the light, just don't call me bitch unless I ask you to. You know, like that was our, we really wanted people to, you know, you know, folks, I, I always said the word titillated. I wanted to, to titillate their senses and make them uncomfortable in their desire. You know, we opened up desire because there, you know, you might have, there was a UPS number that, yeah. you know, did this thing, but somehow by the time it was over, there was a person that looked more female than they had looked to begin with. And that type of thing really like push the envelope in the conversations. It is, I always tell myself I'm going to do this, but I would love to collect all the articles and the books and the research papers and the projects, the films, the videos, all of those things that came out of his kings, this little group right here. Like, like it, it was absolutely amazing in the time the time was right. It was prime for it. It couldn't have probably been any better, obviously, you know, for us to do what we were, what we were doing. We were turning the women's studies department on its ear too. They did not know how to respond. There was a huge amount of folks that hated. I actually was told that my women's studies degree should be revoked because I, we were single-handedly in, in reinstating patriarchy by our performances of <laughs> celebrating oh masculinity. Wow. Wow. I was yes. like, wow, what else can we do? <laughs> uh, but that's I think powerful. That's <laughs> I actually yeah. have, I have the letter. I was looking for it in my little scrapbook because I, I was the historian from the get-go. Um, yep. But we had a letter, a rejection letter from the Michigan Women's Festival. Um, we oh were, my God. We, when we started Whoa. this thing, we didn't know where it was going, but it, it was clear immediately that people wanted more, people wanted to perform, people wanted to watch, people wanted to photograph and write about everything we were doing. And so I'm a traveler. I was like, well, let's hit the road. Let's be like a band and let's hit the road. And so we have set our sights on our region and we traveled all around Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana. And then we're like a natural evolution of that was to go to Michigan Women's Festival. And so we sent that um, application in and I was never so disheartened in my whole life to open up that letter and hear that we were not accepted to perform there because male voices were not allowed on the land. And, you know, it was so heartbreaking um, for so many reasons. And, you know, I still, still struggle with the fact that I never went to that festival. And it was because of that rejection of our expression of our identities. And, you not know, even that, a conversation. Course, yeah. Not even a conversation years, because we would have been open to that. We could, I could hear what they were saying, you mm -hmm. know, like I, I could hear what they were saying. I was there when it very first started, so I could hear it and I knew what the fear was, but it was, it was a slap like I've never felt before, you know, and we did eventually get to, to um, go to the Ohio Lesbian Festival then embraced us um, to a degree, you know, but we will always be the last act at the time when everybody's trying to go to bed, you know, <laughs> and things, things like that. And, you know, feeling awkward to be in costume and trying to get from your tent or whatever it was to there and having, in my opinion, 
they raised me. They raised us. And then they rejected us. They told us it was okay for us to be how we were and are. And then, oh, but not this way. You know, so it was, but we showed them because we, it, we just put our sights on other things. I think it's what drove us. That's why we, we decided to do a conference because uh, several of us, we're all trying to teach something. We're all trying to, whether we, we realize it or not. And what was also interesting in the group is we had people that, that at first were like, oh man, do y'all always have to like talk about, <laughs> you know, all this other stuff. I'm just performing. I just want to perform. Do we have to think about our words that are in our song, do something that switches that up if it's offensive, but it got the conversation into the community and outside of academia too, I feel. Yeah, uh, that's that's fantastic. Let's let's talk a little bit about that too. So it seems like that there's there's a lot of legacies uh, from the troupe. It sounds like you you were did tours. You started um, so, uh, conference. I think uh, let's see. You just said, and we're going to be doing a, a couple of more sessions on a couple of the legacies of uh, the His Kings. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later, but what are what do you feel are some of your legacies uh, of the His Kings um, from that time period? I I'll I'll tell you. I think one of the things that was key. Um, for us was collaboration. Um, we, we started what we did from a place of um, collaboration and community building. And I really feel like that's one of our legacies. And sadly, you know, like we, we said early on, we don't have a RuPaul. You know, RuPaul, he's super popular now. He was popular marginally um, in 1995, you know, enough that that queer people all knew RuPaul, but but RuPaul's name wasn't rolling off of everybody's tongues the way it is now. And we didn't really have a, a comparable person to elevate our art form and our identities into the spotlight. So like Lester said, we took it upon ourselves to create an event. Um, we very deliberatively um, did that in a collaborative way to show, we, we formed not a competition, but a showcase. Um, that's what we called that first IDKE big performance. And the expectation was that we opened up the stage to people who wanted to perform and we didn't audition and we didn't grade and evaluate and you know sashay, shantae away. We said, mm -hmm. we're creating a space and we trusted people to come and do their best. And because by that time we were performing in a space at Wall Street in Columbus that held 400 people. And so we just felt like, look, <laughs> nobody who doesn't have their act together is gonna get up on the stage in front of 400 people and just try to like wiggle their way through. Like they're gonna, they're gonna put their heart and soul into this. They're gonna practice. They're gonna, everything's gonna be spot on and we're gonna make the space and set the tone and we're going to open the door and then we're going to see what happened. And holy cow, like incredible things happened. And, you know, I think that's in part, I feel like a lot of that has to do with our, many of our roots and feminist, um, feminist kind of narratives and backgrounds and philosophies and approaches to doing our work. And we weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but if there's any legacy that we could leave, I feel like the, leaving a legacy within the drag king community of collaboration and support, not competition and um, what's that word? Uh, just just being petty and 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 clawing at each other. We we specifically wrote down in our mission for IDKE that this was about lifting people up, not tearing our community down. Before before we would become what is often true in drag queen communities where there's lots of cattiness and competition. And, and competition, I'm an athlete, competition's fine. 
but we really wanted to create a space of support and community. So I will leave it there, but that, that's what I feel like if I could say what we intended to do and hope to God that it happened, I would say that was our legacy from my perspective. I would also say that we introduced a truly diverse stage. At that time, there were not a whole, there wasn't a whole lot of racial diversity. Maybe one person got to perform in all the shows around town. There were not, um, there were, it was open to different types of performing and you were allowed to go and do whatever you wanted outside of his Kings and we would support you in that. That type of, of um, show directing and producing was not going on now. When we look at the shows here in Columbus, we can see, I can see our footprint on them in the way that we went about. We also had a legacy of, of inclu really including the audience and not not being negative and not being cutting and biting to our audience either. Like it, it, we just did not do that. And so I think that we um, really, one of our legacies is that, that we really embrace diversity. And we really, like if there was a song that somebody was like, ah, Ow. I mean, we had a song where the devil, what did the devil do? The devil, like, I think did something to Jesus or the uh -huh. Mother Mary or something. I can't remember what the devil did. But we had to really have a conversation about how we were going to be to do that. You know, even though I, I would say the majority of people weren't faith, Christian Protestant faith walkers, we still were able to talk through that. And then um, I think that's might've been when we came up with the disclaimers. We, we really thought through what our audience was going to be experiencing and how we would interact. And that was, hey, there's a disclaimer here. This is going to happen just to let you know. And this is why we're allowing it to happen. And that's what kind of show um, this is. So I would definitely, we did a lot for the Columbus AIDS Task Force. We did a, we found ourselves in the most weird and awkward, we were at the garden parties for, you know, the um, Stonewall, the garden parties. And we also did, um, the parades and actually did whole production numbers. I think that we really, really kind of also set the legacy of a troop, of an actual troop um, that, I mean, at our height, we, we practice three times a week and the Thursday before the show, you know, it. We really put our all in it. You couldn't just say, oh, well, I'm being a gay man and that's all you're going to do. Well, there are things to being a gay man and you have to be clear in your head what you're doing. I think that we really um, are, are, we work to perfection. And I think that that is a legacy as well. We, we, gave, we gave the queens, and the gay men a run for their daggone money when it came because we started bringing in the gay men too. The gay men started coming to our shows and not the other shows. So, mm -hmm. cool. Mara, do you have something? Yeah, it's, I think it's a great follow up to to your answer here, Lester. It's a question from the Q and A, um, and this can be for for everyone. But what are your thoughts, especially if you're in Columbus? Um, what are your thoughts? Can you say more about your thoughts on the Columbus drag scene today? Well, 
Well, I know we have, uh, or, or the drag scene wherever you are. I know we've got folks from uh, <laughs> Greece with us today and folks from uh, Hawaii. <laughs> so we've got all kinds of kinds of folks. So um, yeah, I'll I mean, is- you, I'll give is you a little time to think about that one, but there is one other question too. I'll just mm -hmm. throw out there to make sure we catch people's questions. Does anyone remember the King Island show? Oh, yeah. oh my gosh yeah was that a special show or like did something weird happen <laughs> well i didn't think it was special to be invited to go to king's island i mean mm -hmm. you know as many of us grew up in ohio and to get to go be queer at an amusement park i when i was growing up in my like early 20s the only time you could go to Kings Island and be anything like yourself was on the day where they had the red shirt day. And so like you, there was just word spread quietly that all the people wearing red shirts were, were gay. And, and, but then eventually over time, things started to change and the Cincinnati Gay and Lesbian Center put together this pride night at Kings Island. And it was like full of queers and, and you could ride every ride and all of the performances were queer and queer. And I mean, it was, for me, it was really special being able to occupy that space as a queer and with all of my drag king friends. Um, I don't remember the performances as much as I just remember the liberating feeling of being who mm -hmm. I was in that space that was so scary as a young like lesbian or gender nonconforming person. And there were kids there, there were families, you know, that were okay with what we were doing that purposefully came over to see the show you know that was I don't know that was that was pretty cool when we got to do that that was pretty cool um with regard to the king scene in Columbus I am not really connected to it right now I go out and I see the kings perform um but I don't really, I don't, I'm not interacting with them in the ways that I w was before. So um, I know that there is, I don't think that there is not a drag king troop per se. There are a couple people that are trying to pull together some shows. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, but I think across the board sort of uh, gender performance itself has changed and the kind of nature of it has changed. And since you can get the RuPaul girls in or, um, you know, national, national folks in, I feel like we have gotten a little, from my perspective, we've gotten a little overshadowed. Um, yeah. Again. What about the rest? Yeah, the rest of you, the um, Helen, Yvette, Sue, ideas about what where we are with drag today? How is it? Well, uh, let me just tell you this. I live in a remote island in the middle of the Pacific. And the only gay bar on the whole island, I, you know, you can go there and see drag kings perform. And to me, that is such a success story. Um, like, I was actually not in the truth that long because I went back to college. I was like, oh, I should finish college. <laughs> and, but I'll tell you, I went back to Ohio University and I did drag shows there. I got some friends together and we did performances, you know, and we didn't have as organized of a troop like we had with the Higgs Kings, but it, it kind of gave me the okay, like, hey, this, people want this and I want this. So let's just do it, you know? And so we did have shows. And then later on, you know, I moved to, you know, other places and I continued doing drag, you know, here and there, not like a lot, but because to me, it's, um, it, it gives, it gives to everyone and it gives to me. And, you know, I haven't done any drag yet here in, in Kona, but um, 
I love to go to the drag shows and the ladies are there and, and, and it's, and it just says to me like, wow, you know, if it can happen here and happen in these little small towns now, yeah. you know, because at the time, like I said, you know, I, we were the first drag Kings I ever saw. <laughs> I never saw any others. It was us. So, um, to me, it's just like, wow, we, we, we brought it. We, we brought that to the world, you know? <laughs> That's how I feel. Yvette? Um, well, I, I've been out of the scene for quite a while, but I will say that uh, a few years back, I took my uh, straight best friend to a gay bar her first time and also a drag bar. And it was amazing. It was uh, in Indianapolis. And I really hope that they're still performing. The venue was amazing, but it's just, um, you know, performers on both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. Uh, it was called Zoni's Closet. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that place, but phenomenal. In fact, she now my best friend's a fan. She's like, well, when we go back to Indianapolis, I'm like, okay. I, I was shocked. She loved it. Uh, I, that, that is probably the last time I've seen a His King's performance and I, not a His King's, but a King's performance. And that was probably uh, four, five years ago. And you know, Indiana is pretty conservative. So, and the caliber of performances was amazing. So I know that, you know, I was just surprised it was in such a you know, a small, small, smaller city than what Columbus is, uh, having such performances. What about you, Helen? Uh, when I first moved to Greece in 2003, um, I was asked to do a drag show and I did uh, two numbers, Jay-Z and Freddie Mercury. Um, and it, this was at a straight bar, uh, it was full. Um, I would say 30% gay boys. Um, and the reception was, um, I don't know, mesmerizing. Um, I loved it. I loved that I could do something here in Greece because it's, things are still even today a little, uh, not very free. Um, and only in certain circles. Um, but I think that uh, the wider audience would enjoy the shows if they had an opportunity to see one, if one was organized. A friend of mine last year bought a, an old theater and she asked me to um, organize a little troupe so we could have uh, shows on certain nights. Um, she's turning it into a cabaret. So she wants to do variety cabaret um, shows, which she would love drag kings. So I'm looking forward to that once things start going again because of this uh, lockdowns and viruses. Virus. Well, I am sorry to say that we are coming to the end of our time here. We could go on forever, um, but Fortunately, we do have some more uh, time that we're going to be talking about these topics um, here at the Theater Research Institute. And um, I also wanted to mention that um, we are trying to collect up some archives uh, from um, His Kings and also just uh, drag kinging and drag in general. So if um, hopefully we'll have a little repository here where those of you who are interested in studying these wonderful people will have a place that you can come do that. Um, and I am going to first thank you very much for we have, uh, I don't know if we even said this, Helen, Yvette and Sue are the HIS of His Kings. And uh, thank you all, Julie Luster, really appreciate you taking time with us. And I'm gonna throw it briefly back to Mara, who's gonna tell you about our next event with these folks. Hey, y'all. I just yep. put uh, the details for the next event in the chat. It is the King's Court, Kinging and Community 
on October 12th, 3 o'clock p.m. The King's Court is a super fan group formed around his kings. And um, I just can't wait to kind of expand and extend on this conversation and hear more from um, from everyone. This has been fascinating. Um, so you just need to register for the event the same way you came today. It's These are going to be the second Tuesday of um, the next two months after this month. So October 12th, register now. And um, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.